awkward moment until the stream starts. It looks like we're live, and that means I should do my due diligence and put in people's discords that we're going live. Welcome to the Making Awesome podcast. Uh, technically, this is season two, episode 49, but it's also episode 101. And 101 is just supposed to be one of those, like, intro to whatever right and i think it makes sense to talk about injection molding versus 3d printing and why they're both technically incredibly important to you your lives especially if you are in the product development industry or you know you want to take a product to market you've heard us talk to uh inventors and all of that is it starting Yes, it's live. I may not actually be live. Uh, let me verify. YouTube says I'm live. Let's see if Twitch sees it. Yep, Twitch sees it. Yeah, so there it is. Okay, hi. Now we're live. Uh, we were probably live before, so this is a little bit weird. So I'm just going to start over because it makes more sense to do that. But anyways, um, I guess for those that don't know, my name is Grant. I own 3D Musketeers, and we do product development. My background, I have two business degrees, and I've been in the 3D printing industry for 14 years. Um, yeah, I don't know what more you all need to know, because I generally ask the Backstreet Boys of people, but it's a solo episode, and a lot of you already know my background, so we're just going to send it. Like I was saying that a 101 is normally supposed to be like an intro, and we've talked a lot about 3D printing businesses, we've talked about having on inventors, right? We've had really, really cool guests on here. Duff says, keep in mind we missed the first bit due to advertising. You know, that's YouTube. That's not even me. <laughs> I'm not even the one that does that. Uh, sometimes I'll like put ads in certain spots, but no, for live streams, uh, especially when they're solo, I don't do that. But anyways, um, ultimately, if your goal is to get a product to market, I would say minimally go watch some of the previous episodes we talked with like Seth Polanski, Ken Johnson, Lisa Lloyd, and some of the others where they're all basically going to tell you if you don't have experience doing this, it's not the right time to start learning. And I know ultimately everyone's goal is to like make a billion dollars selling the next thing to amazon and all of that it's uh it's tough it's tough to say the least and i think to proceed we effectively have to ignore that struggle because if we don't ignore that struggle we're not going to get past it right to me that struggle is completely a non-continuance and to others, it might not be, but to me, complete non-continuance. I have no desire to take a product 100% to market. Now, I say that, but it's exactly what I'm doing, right? We have the politician that we've been working on, and I'm currently going through a pretty heavy revision on it to look at reducing my time from 12 and a half minutes for assembly for, like, what is needed to ship a kit, to 45 seconds. That's an estimate of 45 seconds. Hopefully it's pretty accurate. But when we look at 3D printing versus injection molding, a lot of people see them as two completely separate things. But in all actuality, they are hand in hand. And a lot of times the line is really, really blurry, like unreasonably blurry, because we have a couple of things that we have to look at when dealing with the two. Right, and I guess I should probably pull up the notes that I made for this so that I know what I'm supposed to be talking about. Because, you know, I will forget these things. That this, this is ADHD at work, everybody. But uh, I, I see Mad Cats hanging out in there, Duff's in there. Patrick Hines says, weird how you're talking about my career in a nutshell. Hopefully I don't upset you too much, but hey, if I get something wrong, don't be afraid to comment. And of course, if you're watching later, we do these live on YouTube basically every weekend. And if you want to come hang out, it's a great place to come and hang out and talk and you get to get shout outs and such. But anyways, 
Injection molding is normally seen as the end all be all top tier period. This is where I want to go. It is my end goal. There is nothing else but injection molding. But I would hedge a bet and say maybe that's not true, especially for those of you with 3D printers already. Because the biggest thing that you have going for you is you already have the tech. And if you do want to go to injection molding, you have to look at doing your design a bunch of different ways. So let's kind of review what we're going to be talking about here. We're going to start with the return on the investment, the ROI, because ultimately it's all about money. And if you tell me your product's not about making money, then you're a charity. You're not a business. And if your goal is to be successful with it and make, you know, and, and like live off of it, but your goal is not to make money, that's not great. Reconsider that. We have a supply chain thing. We've got longevity. So that's like the longevity of the product itself. We have the cost of the product itself. Shipping, importing. We have the strength of the materials. Material options, startup costs, and we have DFAM versus DFM. That's Design for Additive Manufacturing. So if you ever hear me say DFAM in here, I'm talking about Design for Additive Manufacturing. I'm sure I will forget that I already explained it, and I'll explain it again. And then there's also DFM, which is Design for Manufacturing, because there's very, very big design constraints that are different for these. So when we look at return on investment... Um, a lot of you already have 3D printers, right? You have them, they work, you don't have to do anything. And that means your investment is considerably lower than the bulk of people, right? A lot of the goals for people end up being injection molding. And injection molding is great, but oh my God, is it expensive, right? Even just small molds here in the United States, could run you as low as two and a half to three thousand dollars and that's a lot of money when you can get a prusa or hell if you're willing to go through the effort an ender or a cr10 of some sort for less than a thousand or less than 500 bucks if you're you know good with the actual um you know, finding the deals. Mad Cat USA is asking, what about using 3D printing for vacuum form molding? Is that a thing? It is a thing. We do it for a client and it's kind of cool, but the molds don't last very long. Um, we do them at a PETG and I use variable layer height um, to give them the smoothest possible chance that they can get, but they basically have to be dead solid or they start to deform because of the heat involved in that process. So Duff is saying around a couple of grand sounds reasonable, honestly. Well, that's for a part that is incredibly, incredibly simple to design and a part that is incredibly easy to injection mold. You're looking at something with no undercuts, no detail, no nothing. It's basically a flat plate. That won't cost you a ton to get made. But when you're looking at something complicated, Grant's now looking for something complicated. Uh, all right, here. If you're looking at something complicated like a battery, right? Look at all the detail in there that has to lock up perfectly into another injection molded part. And all of this here is a pain to mold. And then, oh yeah, it's two pieces. You can actually see the seam there. And then they have to be sonic welded together. So there, there's a lot to go there. Hey, filament stories, how you doing? Um, the problem that we have with a lot of this, it tends to be on the edge of what is the right move? OK, because generally speaking, domestically, molds are not going to cost two or three grand. They're going to cost 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 thousand dollars. And there's really no way around it unless you're willing to take the risk and go overseas. We've talked about this with Seth Polanski, that there is kind of a problem with intellectual property when you go overseas. And the last thing you want to do is go to market with a product and instantly have it stolen because ultimately, if you're going overseas, those molds may not always stay where they should, and the company might run another shift that's just there to copy everything. So be a little be a little cautious when you do that. Now, to be fair, uh, overseas manufacturing is going to cost so little compared to domestic. But then you run into issues with your supply chain, your shipping, and specifically importing. Uh, previous administrations have not been very kind to China, whether you like it or not. I don't particularly care. This is not a politics podcast, but we 
do have to pay more. And those in Canada and some areas, you know, around the United States have been paying import duties and taxes well above what we pay here in the States for a very long time. So they're used to this. Nothing changed. But when you all of a sudden had the cost of your products come in be 30% higher than they were two months ago, that can really screw up your uh, your entire supply chain and uh, as well as your profits. So political climate hilariously is one of the most important things to keep in mind if you are going to be importing, because that really can bite you in the ass if you are not planning for it. John Drayton is asking, can you 3D print a graphite mold? I'm sure you can, not with machines like this. You can get graphite infused filament. And I do recommend if you're going to do a heat form mold of some sort and you're going to FDM print it, make it out of a carbon fiber filament because it should viably help remove that heat faster. Uh, the only reason that I have this idea is because we used to make carbon fiber cases for mass spectrometers that uh, were gigawatt level lasers but they were for picoseconds and if we used regular petg it would burn a hole right through it if we went with carbon fiber infused petg it barely left a mark so you know and you can't just put a piece of metal there on a laser because that'll reflect and it makes it problematic so we look at return on investment right and what is your time worth to you ultimately speaking to me I'd rather keep it domestic unless you have a good contact that you can trust, that has connections, or preferably lives overseas, right? Having someone with boots on ground is way more valuable, right? And we saw this recently with Naomi Wu where a company was basically telling an individual that, hey, if you want all of this stuff to be open source, you have to come to us, which is not really the way that that is supposed to work, but that's the way it did work. And Naomi being on ground in mainland China said, F this, I'm going in and walked right into this place and demanded all the files. And she recorded its videos on her channel. Ultimately, though, injection molds have one big benefit. Well, a few, but the big one that people look at, speed and durability. 3D printers need a lot of maintenance, especially if you're going to run them 24 by 7 in a print farm setup. Injection molds are ran by people that know what the hell they're doing, and it no longer becomes your problem. There are normally a few different materials to make molds out of. The more affordable ones will be made out of aluminum, and at best you'll get about 150 to 200,000 pieces out of that. And you might say, Grant, that's enough. No, it's actually not. If you're looking to go to mass market and you're not just doing a short production run of maybe a couple thousand pieces, aluminum will need to be made over and over and over again. You also have tool steel, which is good for at least, generally speaking, a million. But ultimately, the longevity of your molds relies heavily on the material that you're using. If you're using something like a polycarbonate or heaven forbid, a glass fiber, carbon fiber, glass ball reinforced material, you will wear out your molds much faster. And that's where tool steel comes in. And even those will get worn out, but they're easier to service and repair rather than needing to scrap and fully rebuild. Ostrike is saying that injection molds are expensive because they are A, made of materials that remain durable, elevated temperatures, and two, processed from an aesthetically smooth surface finish. That's very true, that you can get incredibly smooth detail out of a milling machine, right? And you'll get crazy, crazy fine detail that will look perfect. But objectively, resin printing is also getting to that point. And looking at high temp resins like a Soraya Tech Blue or I know Nexa 3D just did a, uh, a whole white paper on how they 3D printed molds for Pepsi for prototyping, blow molding for their bottles, right? They were trying out slightly different shapes and it makes more sense at that point to 3D print a mold that's gonna last 150 or 200 shots than it does to make one out of aluminum. But it also makes certain that you have to have the right tools. You have the right tools and you work with what you got. There's no point in buying a $40,000 mill to run a mold that you know you're gonna have to iterate on. It makes more sense to maybe resin print it for even a couple of grand, if you got to pay someone to do it for a couple of grand, than it does to buy an entire machine if that machine is not going to get used. 
The thing with injection molding is that you can do it at home, hilariously. Uh, and there are tons of ways to do it. You can even look at like roto molding, resin casting. Um, and to me, the right way to go is like 3D printing, roto molding, or resin casting, then injection molding. Because resin casting is fine. It's just tedious. Roto molding, kind of the same, somewhat tedious, uh, but is way easier because you could just build the machines with a 3D printer to make it work. Um as John Drayton is saying that post-processing after DFAM will be a lot less than CNC or division methods. I agree. Um, DFAM, and I guess we're going to get to that real quick. Um, DFAM is what a lot of you know. Design for added manufacturing. Reduce all overhangs when at all possible. Make sure that there's little to no support material. If you want to have a hole, make sure that you have... Uh, a, a rectangle, uh, you know, at 90 degree angles. So you have one rectangle, then another rectangle on the layer above it, which will give you the circle without any support needed, right? You look at ways that you could remove the necessity of support because any amount of human labor involved in this is a bit of a problem. <laughs> With DFM, Design for Manufacturing, it is a whole different game. You have to deal with draft angles. You cannot generally have hard uh, hard edges. Um, Lego is kind of famous for having a hard edge. And if any of you stepped on a Lego brick at night, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It is truly the worst form of torture. Waterboarding, that's number two. Stepping on Legos, that's number one. Uh, because what Lego does, they put the draft angles on the inside of the bricks and not the outside. And honestly, it's kind of amazing. Um, John Drayton is asking, what is the accuracy on resin toothpaste that looks like PLA and uses ultraviolet light? I don't know what you're talking about. Um, we look at MSLA and SLA resin printers. Uh, you can go as low as like an Elegoo Saturn, Elegoo Mars. Um, but a lot of people look at the Forum Labs, the Nexa Zips, and, and some of the others that are a little bit larger, uh, when you're looking to do production work and you'll get detail well within a couple thou. I mean, I, I'm i pulling two thousandths or better on our Prusas, like, consistently. It's not that difficult. Um, you do have to tune them. You have to get them used to it. But the nice thing is, when you buy the same damn printers and you assemble them the same damn way, they generally work reasonably close to each other. But if you are going to do molds, I normally say resin. Um... You can look at doing metal molds as Mitsu Level is talking about. Uh, oh, he's saying torture stuff. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. Mad Cat USA says, I think I know what John is talking about. It's a resin printer that extrudes like an FFF printer, but uses UV LEDs to insecure the line. Okay, that's the um, Massive It system. No. Uh, Massive It is not designed for injection molding. Those are designed to make big damn parts fast that are then going to get bondoed, painted, whatever it is. They get finished in post. Their layers are very thick. They're not designed to look pretty. They're designed to be fast. But, uh, anyways, when we look at this return on investment, right? A lot of people say, well, I can just build a print farm. You can, but what you're again forgetting is maintenance. We run Prusas, and generally speaking, I don't really do a lot of maintenance. I know I should. Spoiler alert, I don't. I don't practice what I preach because as a business, it is easier for me just to replace the parts when they fail than it is for me to completely disassemble the X and Y axis once a month to repack the bearings and all of that. I'll just put a little oil on them and run them till they seize. And when they seize, I'll just buy new bearings and rods because I only want to do it once. Now we're going to get into belt printing here. I don't think I've talked about this publicly, but I did buy a CR30. I bought it used, got a very good price on it, and it likely needs some work. We're going to do that as a live stream coming up here relatively soon. So if you're not subscribed, get subscribed. Greatly appreciate that support. But belt printing does remove one of those big issues, which is part removal. 
We also have the Quinley system, which I do have a Quinley system. Again, future live stream coming up where I'm going to install a 3DQ Quinley onto a Prusa Mark 3S. Because, again, I want to test it. This is literally to see for me what the best move is going to be for my business. And at the same time, make some cool content. And full disclosure, I was provided that Quinley kit at absolutely no cost. And, you know, it's nice if I go ahead and make a video. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we've actually interviewed the 3DQ team and they're pretty cool. So go check out that episode when this one is over, if you haven't already. Mods, if you want, go ahead and toss in links as I'm talking about them. I'm not going to bother doing it because I'm on a solo episode and that means I have to pay attention to what I'm doing or I'm going to ADHD into oblivion. So we look at then what your ROI looks like. And the goal for you as a business owner is to remove as much of your time as possible. And let's, for just an instance, do a bit of a, a challenge. Pay yourself $15 an hour. And if it takes you two minutes to swap over a print, and you're swapping over 40 prints a day on 40 printers, and then you still have to do all the, you know, Shipping, boxing, uh, packaging, assembly, if that needs to be done. All of the sudden, the time to flip over a print, two minutes, starts to add up very quickly, especially if your prints are short. On The Politician, I've gotten the prints down to 10 hours for an entire kit of The Politician. Um, and viably, it takes me about 30 seconds to un to take it off the bed because I go, crap. But then I got to pick up the parts. If one of them flies off into a low Earth orbit, I'm probably not going to go find it. I'm just going to make another one because, again, that is really the way that I want it to be. Oh, Ostrak is saying, does anyone else not follow rectangles and make a hole? Okay, let me go back over that. So if you have a blind hole, right, so that, that's a hole that then shrinks down a little bit. Right, and you got to put a screw in it, so you're um, you're you're countersinking a screw, but you're not using the traditional chamfer method. You want to completely bury the head of a socket cap screw, for instance. Um, you can't chamfer this; it it you won't be able to hide it. Uh, what you have to do is you have to create a divot. You have to create a hole that the head can sit in. The problem is that means that the hole for your threads and the hole for the head of the bolt are different sizes. And if a printer goes to try to print that, it's printing in free air. So traditionally what you do is you do a rectangle. So you have your hole, you have a rectangle that is on either side like this, okay? And that makes, instead of a hole, it makes a rectangle. And it's a bridge. Your printer can do a completely straight across bridge, no problem. It cannot do a hole in open air without any problems. It, it requires you to either have support or send it and drill it out instead. If you have one rectangle and then another rectangle on top of it, if you notice, it's kind of like a square. And if that square is roughly the same XY dimensions as the diameter of your circle, you are no longer actually printing in free air for the entire circle. And instead, you're doing a very, very short bridge, which your printer can do every single time. It's what we've done with the politicians so that nothing requires support. There is only one part of the politician that requires support, and I'm trying to figure out how I can remove that because that little bit of support is like 20 extra seconds. And that 20 seconds when you're looking to do production runs matters a ton. Because I can't just build a system that aligns with the bed to dump parts into a box and then carries the boxes to somewhere else. There is another step that a human must do, which is removal of support. Now, you could look at doing soluble support material, but if you don't have a high-end 3D printer, chances are you're not using it. And that's why I've put money down on a uh, Prusa XL, because I want to play around with soluble support as well as other colors. As well as multi-material uh, prints where you print in PLA, your supports are PETG, then you have a very small amount of PVA, which is your interface layers. And then it costs you very little to do prints like that. Hopefully that explains it for you, Ostrike. If not, let me know in the comments and I will make sure to get that resolved. 
again, when we look at your strength, a homogenous injection molded part, nine times out of 10 will be stronger than anything you can FDM or resin 3D print. It's just a fact, right? We all know that 3D prints are weakest about the Z axis. And I believe that's fair for resin as well, but resin in general is just brittle, right? If you don't dope your resin with tenacious or some other flexible, you're probably going to have a bad time. I say that as I have a bottle of Meyer makes resins, which I still need to actually print with. I'm sorry. Things have gotten a little crazy here in the recent weeks, months. But there are resins out there that claim to be, you know, peak and peck, and that's polyether ether ketone, P-E-E-K, or P-E-K-K, peck, which is polyether ketone ketone, peck. Um, Patrick Heim is asking, have I not looked into a tri-extruder one nozzle printer? I have. They're ridiculous. Don't waste your time. The reason is, is that your materials were printed at different temperatures. And PVA wants like 180C, whereas PETG wants 240. Printing PVA at 240 will burn it, and printing PETG at 180 will get it to clog your nozzle. That's why I don't like printers that feed multiple filaments into one nozzle, right? Like the diamond, um, the diamond hot end does that. I don't like it. It, 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 it's just not a thing. Um, okay. Strength is the big thing. And you can mess around a little bit, right? Like pure nylon 3D prints are actually pretty strong, but it's because of the thermal properties and the properties of nylon and not the properties of anything else, right? And that's nylon being nylon. It's not your 3D printer being better. I promise you it's weak about the Z. Now you can look at something like maybe a Mark Forge machine that will do, you know, laid in carbon fiber. Um, that is good, but those machines start at 20 grand. So take that with whatever grain of salt. We got Awestrike with the $3 sticker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Helps, uh, Helps the helps me do things like this, right? We were actually supposed to have spoiler alert. Um, the guest canceled on me like Friday night, um, and uh, we were supposed to be all about metal three D printing. Was supposed to be this week, so we're gonna reschedule them for another week, and we're gonna talk all about metal, like LPBF, DMLS, uh, SLM. They're an expert in metal, and uh, I'm really excited to talk about that. Uh, anyways, when we look at that strength. You can go into metal 3D printing, but even cheap metal printers. Again, I'm going to mention Mark Forge because I do think they have one of the cheaper metal printers on the market, which is the Metal X. And that's going to run you at least a, a, a cool 100 Gs. And if you're going to spend 100 Gs on a 3D printer, go get a damn injection mold and be done with it. There are home-based injection molding machines. I had one uh, for like six months and I used it twice because they kind of suck. Um, a lot of the ones are, uh, they're called Morgan presses where it's got a handle and a lever arm and you're physically forcing normally it's ABS into a mold that you make. You can make it out of wood. You can make it out of resin. You can make it out of metal. I don't care. You make a mold, shoot hot plastic into it. Bob's your auntie from there. I said, well, I want one that's pneumatic because I just want to press a button and it goes ka-chunk fills the mold. 10 minutes later, I come back and I release it. I could release it earlier than that, but, you know. The problem is that uh, the piston gets stuck very easily. And uh, that's not good. And you're not going to be able to quickly move the mold over again. So if you want to just test a design with a small injection molding machine, you can. But I imported that one. And it ran me about $800 or $900 to do it. And I never got my money out of it, right? I actually ended up selling it for what I paid. So I didn't lose any money on it. But what I did lose, which is way more valuable than the money, is my time. I spent days and days and days troubleshooting that stupid machine. And I finally said, it's not effing worth it. It would be easier for me to make a silicone mold and resin cast it. That's what we did. 
Now, ultimately, I found I also suck at resin casting, so I should probably stay in my lane and stick with 3D printing. And so we work with a resin casting facility that knows what they're doing, right? But you can use companies like SmoothOn to learn resin casting. Just understand that some resins need a uh, degassing system, so that's a pressure pot or a vacuum chamber. Others don't. You want to look at your pot times, your cure times, and all of that. And don't go for the shortest cure time possible because it will cascade cure, which is where the material, I kid you not, effectively goes into thermal runaway. And, well, that's bad for business because you'll lose all of your material. It won't cure properly. And if you're really unlucky, burn your mold. So then it's, well, Grant, I can just make a bunch of resin or I can make a bunch of silicone molds get a resin with a pot time of like an hour and pour 200 of them at a time. Sure, go ahead. Where the hell are you going to store 200 silicone molds? And then how are you going to take all the time to demold it, clean off the flashing, and then get it ready for shipping? Do you see the problem that we have here? It always comes down to you, to me, to us, the people, because we have a finite amount of time in the day. That's why I like 3D printers. As long as you have an automated system, they'll run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, generally speaking, without too much failure. But when they do fail, you know what to do. You go in there, you replace some bearings, you tighten some V-wheels, whatever the hell you need to do, and you're done. Now, we talked about roto-molding previously, and it's something that I have effectively zero experience with. I've seen big roto molds before. I've hit the button to turn them on, but that is my entire experience with roto molding. Now, uh, a buddy of mine who I hang out with every week, if you guys do want to come hang out with uh, makers like myself and others, uh, you can go follow Matt Stoltz on Twitter and he does a Friday night maker hangout call. Um, We talk about many things, including roto molding and Matt does a lot of roto molding. And uh, I was talking about a project that we had, and Matt said, you could have rotomolded the hell out of that, and it would have saved you a ton of time. And he was probably right. I didn't consider it, because sometimes you get that one-track mind of, it's either going to be printed or it's going to be injection molded, and there is absolutely no in-between. I laugh because that job I quoted at, even at the volume they needed, which was 6,000 pieces, I quoted at $180 a piece. They found someone with an FDM print farm, able to and willing to print those at at $56 delivered. There is no money. There is no money in that. None. This thing needed a ton of support. There was no, I, I said, good on you guys. I am not going to touch that. That is way too low for me. Like the part used $10 of material minimum, right? And if you wanted to make it real strong, you're probably going to use closer to a full kilo That's a pain in the ass. That's a lot of material that you have to ship in. And that becomes, again, a supply chain problem. Madcat USA says, I'm going to preface this idea with a statement that I know next to nothing about resin printing, only what I've learned from watching your videos, Grant. Thanks. But could you not make a mold that is clear slash translucent with a hole in it that you could then fill with resin, set on a three-axis roller, turn turn on the UV lights, roll it for a minute or so, then empty? That is roto-molding with UV curable resin. I don't I don't think I would do it that way. Um, I would just use an epoxy that has a very short cure time. Um, you know, but you can also... I don't exactly know how they do it. I don't know if they use epoxy. I You could viably, I guess if you spin it fast enough, centripetal force would kind of force it over the mold and it wouldn't drip all over the place. But you could just put a UV light source on the inside. I don't know. Um... And yeah, Chris Catlett uh, makes a good point. Good luck separating the resin molds, because if it's the same material, you're going to have a bad time. Uh, So yeah. John Drayton is asking if there is filament with silicone. There are some really soft TPUs. In fact, um, I know some people that are going to be testing out some 60A. That's like pencil eraser soft uh, filament, and that's going to suck. There are specialized printers that can print in silicone, but again... If you have to ask how much they cost, the answer is you cannot afford it. And I hate that because it's kind of a dick thing to say, but it's also the truth. If you have to ask, you can't afford it. 
when we look at the value, to me, the big value of injection molding is your cost in the long run. You might spend $50,000, $50,000 on a mold, which is a ostensibly shitload of money. And if anyone has 50 grand to spare, I welcome you to go over to our Patreon, patreon.com slash 3D Musketeers and uh, join the Musketeer tier, which is precisely $420 and 69 cents because it's my Patreon and I can make jokes if I want to. (laughs) Um, But if you have that kind of money and you're willing to blow it, fine, good on you. But really the value is economies of scale a part off a 3d printer might take 20 hours and cost you let's just go with 10 bucks that same part via injection molding will likely not cost you anything close to five dollars raw then you got to figure out what else needs to be done to it there's a lot of value in that and you look at amortization the the saying goes that the first Dixon Ticonderoga, that's the number two pencil, like the iconic number two pencil that everybody is used to. Um, the first Dixon Ticonderoga cost over a million dollars to produce. And they've been around for literally decades. But the second one cost a fraction of a penny. And that's where the money is made. The money is made in economies of scale. So if you've done an initial run, you've verified functionality, you've had uh, all of this, you know, research to verify that what you're doing is going to work, spend the money. You can run what's called a break-even analysis or your BE, the business term is break-even point, so a BEP, um, but you run a break-even analysis and you look at what is your cost for your material via 3D printing. What is your amortization of your 3D printers? Like how often will they just need to be replaced? Now, remember as a business, you're not going to sit there and spend six hours diagnosing a problem on a printer. You're going to spend the thousand dollars and just buy another one because it makes more sense. We have many more machines than we need at any given time, mainly because I have random crap from the YouTube channel, but Also because if a printer goes down, I'm going to quickly and efficiently set up another machine to take its place. Because any downtime is money lost, right? But you look at all of that and factor in about a 20% failure rate for 3D printing. You will likely not have anywhere near that. But when you look at downtime, you look at uh, random print failures and all of that. It's not too unreasonable, and I'd rather have you look at your 3D prints cost more than they do than have you underestimate your cost and end up losing very, very, very precious margin. So, Ostrike says, I used to be a millionaire, then I bought the first pencil, having trouble with resale. (laughs) First Dixon Ticonderoga, $1 million, cash offers only. Uh, bidding starts at 1 million, no low ball offers. I know what I have. Uh, <laughs> so Osterike, what you should be doing is, uh, going to California and sell it there as a small, uh, portable bungalow with, uh, multi-material insulative properties. Uh, filament stories. Thanks for the $20 super chat says nice plug on the Patreon. Don't forget the earth fund. You totally need to make it for earth. Oh, Duff, you didn't need to delete that. That was a funny, that was a funny comment. I was fine with that. Uh, (laughs) Yes, we are trying to get to Murph and Murph, or Earth, sorry, Earth. Earth is very expensive. So uh, if you guys do want to support the channel and support me going to Earth, and that means content, it also means that I'm bringing my scanner to Earth. Um, Right now, it's going to be just the Artec Eva. And if I get the other scanner back by then, uh, we'll be the other scanner as well. So we will be doing scanning at Earth. Uh, so I'll, you know, do the full Joel. Maybe if uh, Uncle Jesse shows up, we'll get to scan him then. Unfortunately, we won't, we won't be able to scan Frank from Frankly Built, who was our podcast guest last week. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. It wasn't intentional. Awestrike. No, n- n- uh, no disrespect on the deleting of the comment. <laughs> uh, can I undelete it? No, I can't. Dang. Okay, well, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy and paste. 
Yeah, you can't undelete. Oh, well, is what it is. All right, back on track. You look at all of that time, and ultimately speaking, do I, oh, I'm deciding if I want to go into, uh, like, the actual money behind the politician or if it's going to piss people off when they kind of understand how I'm going through it. So you know what? I'm not going to. I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to talk about it too much. Mad Cat, thank you for the $10 sticker. I appreciate it, sir. Uh, thank you again for your support and being a channel member as well. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you guys for your support on this. Um, anyways, when we look at injection molding, if you do it domestically, quite literally, your expenses are the mold. How many parts are going to be produced? And then the profit that the injection molding facility is going to make, right? And they build that right in to everything for you. It's all there, right? If they tell you it's going to be uh, $5 to produce your part, that's $5. And then if you need to go pick it up or you need to ship it, that's, of course, different. Um, Duff messed up fund. <laughs> Thanks, Duff, for the super chat. 1399 Canadian says the Duff messed up fund. Thank you, guys. I appreciate the support. Uh, it really does help out the channel a lot. Thank you. Seriously. Um. But yes, it, when you look at injection molding, your cost is so much less. If you go overseas, be very, very careful. If any of you had injection molding parts, and even some of the companies that we work with now, still have multiple, multiple months lead time on injection molding stuff. And this is a company that owns the damn injection molding facility in China. They're quite literally dealing with such a bad problem with getting things delivered and shipped in that they've shut down their injection molding side of their business for the time being, which sucks because they're one of my favorite clients and we do a lot of fun work with them. That means they've disappeared. Of course, that means you keep a good relationship with everybody. When things come back, you make sure they remember you. That's some sales tips for you. But for them, they saw that going to paper, a uh, waxed paper, made a lot more sense than injection molding because they could get 80% of the clients that they were working with over to wax paper and away from like a polypropylene or polyethylene. You also have to worry about shipping costs. Shipping is generally charged by the container and they don't care if there's one thing in there or 1 million things in there. It's by the container and then the weight. And what if you have a container on the evergreen? When it decided to pull an Austin Powers in the Suez, Suez, was it in the Suez Canal? I think it was. You know, what if it tried to pull an Austin Powers and got stuck? And if you're waiting for that incredibly necessary materials, you, my friend, are screwed. And this is why things like Kickstarter scare the ever-loving hell out of me. Like, uh, and I, I shit on Bamboo Lab a lot, a lot, because... I am wary of a brand new company like that, but they actually had a massive supply chain problem. Quite literally, they had a train wreck. There was a train that wrecked with a ton of their equipment on it and destroyed most of the printers. Now, this was, as far as I can tell, strictly around the EU uh, and the deliveries in the EU. But that is one hell of a supply chain problem. Now, likely there's insurance to take care of that, but insurance is going to do an investigation. You're 120 days out minimum before you're even looking at a payout. So you have to front that extra expense to make new product and then to hyper ship it, right? And normally what you end up doing is actually taking it away from those who won't notice an extra week delay and give it to those who have already dealt with a three to four week delay. And that's not good because that's scrambling. That's reactionary. And you want to be proactive at this, right? Let's shift and look at your, um, your importing. So those of you that have never done importing before do not know what an absolute effing disaster it can be. My buddy Shane, we've actually interviewed him a few times. He's uh, used to live right up the road. I say up the road, it was like an hour and a half away. Uh, but he used to live up the road here. But he ended up moving back to Prague because Shane works for Big Orange. Uh, works for Prusa. And Shane moved like two months ago. His stuff is still stuck in customs. His computer... A lot of the things that he needs are still stuck in 
customs. That's a problem. And if you deal with something like that, let's say the container's not full of just your stuff. There's somebody else's stuff in there too. And their stuff might be illegal. Their stuff might be questionable. Their stuff might be lithium. And there was a problem. You too are going to get caught. And while you are able to send an attorney down to the Port Authority, uh, create some hubbub, write some strongly worded letters, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. You've added delay that you can't control. And as soon as a business owner loses control of their product, the product is effectively doomed to fail. Now, at some point, that control is put to somebody else, right? You as a solopreneur, right, a single entrepreneur, um, m might be dealing with all the bullshit up front, but as it grows, that is somebody else's problem. That's my favorite kind of problem, is somebody else's problem. But you have to also make sure that then your team can delegate properly. It's a thing. Ostrike saying if the shipping department used more bubble wrap, the shipment would have survived the crash. I don't know. I never looked that far into it. We were going to put it on a Print Fix Friday episode, uh, but I it felt to me that that was in real bad taste. But anytime that I put bamboo in the title or we put bamboo in the tags, the videos just do better. So <laughs> there's one of those weird things like, do I do it to be a dick? Do I do it for the al the almighty algorithm or do I do it just because it's funny? And I felt like making fun of a company for what an insurance uh, claim would call an act of God. That's not fair because you're making fun of them for something they couldn't control. Um, and by the way, I don't know if it would have survived, but... Um, Chris Catlett says most train incidents are not aren't bubble wrap avoidable. If you bubble wrap the whole train, maybe. 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 But shipping can be one of those cases where you completely and utterly lose control. And when that happens, you got a Jesus take the wheel moment. And that is not where you want to be. Okay. I'm going to tell a personal story here. Um, and it's about how I toured an Amazon facility at 1130 at night. I ordered material for an emergency job. I needed about 800 grams to finish it. So I ordered in four kilos, two separate shipments of four kilos. I ordered an eight total. I sent them, I had one in the morning and I had one in the afternoon and I paid for overnight shipping on Amazon thinking, ah, oh, if they lose one of the boxes, I'll still get the other. It's no big deal. Amazon is not an online marketplace. Amazon is a logistics and shipping company. That is what they do. Their business is not in online marketplace. They make their money in logistics. That's what they charge you for. They charge you for logistics. Amazon, in their great wisdom, decided to ship both packages together and lost the box. I could see that its last scan was at a local Amazon warehouse. And so I do what business owners need to do sometimes. You buy a share of the company's stock, you go look at its most recent shareholder meeting minutes, and you get the contact information for whomever it is you need to talk to. Now, they'll likely not answer their phone, but if you want to go through the call tree, you can, but you're going to get frustrated and you might end up yelling at people. I got lucky in the fact that the guy that I called, who was the vice president for logistics for the entirety of the United States, answered my call. And I said, here's the deal. You don't know me. I don't know you, but I've got a problem. Let me tell it to you. I ordered all these things, you guys lost them, and you're telling me the shipment is delayed. I paid for overnight shipping, and I even did it in a way that meant that I was paying for two separate shipments. You decided not to do that. That is a fail on your system, not mine. I need my equipment, or it's going to completely destroy my business. How are we going to solve this? Well, sir, you just have to wait till we find it. I said, no, that's actually not how we're going to do it. We're going to have someone go through your facility. Well, you know, sir, that facility's closed to the public. I said, it shows here on Google that it closes at 10. It's 9 p.m. It's a 25-minute car ride down there. So we have 35 minutes for one of your staff to find it, and I can just go pick it up from them. I said, if not, I'm going in. I said, if you want to call the police and trespass me, by all means. I got no priors. It's no big deal. I'll bring bail money. 
but I need to, I need my business to survive because that news story reads Amazon failed at doing the thing that they were supposed to do, cost small business everything. Now, unfortunately, that has become an all too common thing with Amazon. They're ruining small businesses, but that's neither here nor there. Lo and behold, they never found it. We showed up. We get a phone call from my guy saying, you're out front, aren't you? I said, yes, I am. My headlights are on. He said, okay, uh, they're finishing a team meeting and I'll have someone come out and talk to you here in just a bit. That person came out and offered me a tour and said, why don't we look together? And we did. And we found the box exactly where it was supposed to be. No one bothered to check exactly where it was supposed to be. And so I took my box and I went home. There's a bit more to that story there, but it's not friendly for this podcast. That is one of those cases where I put my trust into a company that completely failed. And I did the Tommy Boy chicken wing. I had nothing to lose. I wasn't going to get arrested. I was going to get trespassed at best. And I was going to leave. Right? It's no big deal. Maybe even a verbal warning if I can, you know, hedge a good bet and talk to the officer and they're reasonable. This was years ago. <laughs> um, that is not a case I like being in, right? And the only reason I was in that predicament to begin with was because the material that I had bought was specific for what the client wanted and the filament was garbage. It was garbage filament and I had multiple spools that were absolute shit. I had bought enough to do the job like one and a half times over, but I had so many bad spools that were brittle, that weren't printing, that I honestly smelled like ABS, but when it clearly wasn't marked as ABS that I ended up having to order more. So, yeah. That was a problem for me. I had to rely on other buddies that had more printers to basically eat their production time to help me out. Now, ultimately, we did succeed on that project, but I'll tell you that was one of the most stressful times in my life because I didn't know what the hell to do. And I said, F it. I'm either going to lose my business here or I'm going to succeed. So I have nothing to lose. So I did what I had to do, but you don't want to find yourself in that predicament when you're dealing with domestic people, especially, especially, especially if you can find somebody local, that is really where you want to be. I gotta get some water here. Now I have been very public about this. If I haven't, I'm going to be right now. 3D Musketeers does not do injection molding. We have an injection molding facility that we work with about an hour and a half south of us. Um, it is Spectrum Custom Molds and Manufacturing. If anyone wants to look them up, I talk about them constantly to, to customers. I just don't know if I talk about it too much about it on the podcast itself. But uh, it's a veteran-owned small business, and uh, the owner's name is Mike Guidaboni. He's definitely not Italian. But uh, Mike's a great guy. Mike has really done amazing work for every one of our clients and uh, to the point where mike is so busy we're taking overflow work from him now like we're we're assisting in some things where we can uh lavender De uh, devilry nice nice name stumbled across this channel quite the insight you're providing thank you my brother says so tarzan 013 says thanks feel free to subscribe they have to subscribe to write a comment. So that's a thing that I've done. I have made it so it's subscriber only chat. Damn it. It works. <laughs> um, fun fact that you can do that for YouTube, but I have it set for 60 seconds. Uh, Patrick Himes says, I walked away from a machine shop. That's whole business plan was that Amazon story and would blame employees like me for very small mistakes. <sighs> That's probably more of a mental health problem than anything else. Um, there might be a video coming up on that. I don't know yet, but it's one that hilariously for a long time, I was talking about having a mental health professional on this channel. And then we did. And nobody watched the video. Like that video is one of the, the poorest watch videos from a podcast standpoint that we've done in a long time. It has like sub 300 views. And it was a really good one where we talked very frankly about, um, mental health and especially as makers. But, uh, I think I found someone who'd be a really cool podcast guest to talk about that once again. So maybe we'll do that in the future. 
But uh, a lot of dealing with small businesses, and I say this as a small business owner myself and as someone that does struggle with this. So, hi, I'm being vulnerable on a live stream. This is fun. Uh, is that relinquishing that control is difficult because a lot of times when you've relinquished control to others, they don't take it as seriously as you do. Spoiler alert, they're not going to, they never will, and you can't expect them to. So if you need it done precisely your way, guess what? You're doing it yourself. And if you can't give your staff the leeway that they need to do things their way, they're going to resent you. And if then you yell at them for it, they're going to leave. And that's not good. You can lose very good staff members from a massive breakdown of communication. And you don't want that because you're going to find yourself in a place of being alone and having high turnover of staff. You're going to find yourself not, uh, not great. Now, I can say that we have some turnover, right? Some turnover is expected. Uh, but a lot of it's because they're getting poached, which is totally fine, right? Like, as a business owner, my job is to either help you turn working for me or with me, I should say, into a career, or it's to help you find a better job that's going to pay you more than I can. That's what it's all about. But yeah, if you have a shitty work situation, it doesn't work. And people are going to leave. Anyways, when we work with local injection molding facilities, we get to control kind of the whole supply chain of it, right? They get in the raw materials. If it's not something they have in stock, he's got a guy, right? They've got guys, right? And that's what you want. You want someone's like, oh, I got a guy for that. 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 Same. That's one of my big things of being a product developer is we've worked with like companies as crazy as Smithsonian and individuals as crazy as Snoop Dogg and everything in between. So it means that when someone needs something, chances are I've got a guy or a gal or something in between um, or none of the above, I guess. Um, that is incredibly valuable. And that's why knowing no one to hold them, no one to fold them, no one it's time to outsource matters so bloody much. But for me, and specifically the politician, right? It's the product that we are going for mass market consumer adoption, specifically in the 3D printing industry. And we are going to price it aggressively, incredibly aggressively. I'm looking to hopefully get a kit. And this is not including a power supply because I'm kind of calling out makers on this one. Y'all probably have 24 volt power supplies laying around and there's no point for you to pay extra for one unless you need it and we'll offer them separately should you want it but i'm hoping to be able to price this thing at a 50 dollars price point now again i've been talking about trying to automate some of the process which involves making custom components we might have to raise the cost a little bit to accommodate that that way we still make the margins that we need to but i'm trying to reduce that time because if I can reduce the time, I can spend more on a cooler custom part, right? If I'm spending $15 in time to build one of these products, if I just go get something custom made for $10 a piece, I'm saving $5. Now, on the books, I'm going to be spending more money. But in my time, I'm going to free up a ton of it. And that is way more valuable for me as a business owner. I'll make less real margin but the intrinsic margin goes through the roof because now my time I can spend making more YouTube videos where I mention it and I make thinly veiled ads for it. Yeah, if you didn't think that was coming, you're out of your mind. There, it's going to be coming. But we've chosen to do 3D printing because our goal is to continually iterate this design. And we can do different colors. And if you want a custom one-off color, let's say you want it out of uh, Filament Story's favorite color, Protopasta's Nebula, uh, you could get it assuming they make a PETG because we are going to require that most of it's made out of PETG. And we'll have just stock colors where we'll say, hey, random color is this price. If you want your own color, you know, it's an extra. I'll probably charge an extra two or three dollars to have whatever color you want because that means I have to run a custom job just for it. Um, but in the end, it's still, you know, again, make a little bit of extra money that pays for the time that you put into, you know, taking care of that extra bit. 
but I'm choosing to go 3D printing simply because it's going to speak more to my target audience. I could go injection molding, spend, this one's probably would be pretty expensive. There are some difficult parts in it. And uh, it would be a disaster. Like probably spend fifty to eighty thousand dollars to get it done here in the states, and well, I don't want to go overseas for it. I, I very much want to keep full on production domestic. Um, it's just easier. It's easier to talk to people. It's easier to negotiate. If I want to go see how they're made, let's say I want to go make a video on how we make the politician. I can just go drive to the manufacturing facility, take a camera inside, bring some GoPro, stick them into CNC machines and shit, and send it. Whereas Getting on a flight to China is a little problematic, and then getting access is even more problematic. And so the startup costs with injection molding are considerably higher, but it will work out for you generally better in the long run, and that's okay. Zach Tech says, really enjoy the podcast, Frank, last week. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, that one was, uh, that was a last minute thing. That was pretty cool to get Frank on for episode 100. Um, Duff says it's a write-off. I, I don't know what you're referencing for write-off. Mad Cat is asking Protopost Nebula. Is that anything like Polymaker Galaxy Dark Blue? I don't know. I have some Galaxy Dark Blue from Polymaker and I haven't used it, but you can go head over to Filament Stories YouTube channel and go watch her videos on it. She just did the most recent one for the uh, endless subscription from uh, Protopasta where she did look at the nebulas. So... A video a video manufacturing facility in China probably counts as espionage. You're probably not wrong, Awestrike. I, I don't uh I, I I don't disagree. Oh, and yes, it is okay, Duff is saying the, the trip to China is a write-off. Yes, Duff, but you need to have the profit to write it off against. That's a thing that people like it's the Seinfeld thing of oh it's a write-off, oh it's a write-off, oh it's right. Write yes, it's a tax write-off. But if you're not paying enough taxes to have the money to write it off then it does you no good. And yes, you can defer it to next year and the year after that, but it doesn't do you any good. So, yeah, be careful there. 3D printing is nice, though, because you can build racks like we have behind us. These are racks from Sam's Club. And while I do have our filament on the bottom here, you could put another shelf down there. And uh, you're... Oh, yeah, and there's a Shit's Creek reference, too, right? Um... You can put four Pruces wide, three shelves total. You can get them with, they come with four shelves, but if you do the three shelf, you can turn two kits into three kits long because you're able to, it's a thing. Try to think about what I'm saying there. I, it's complicated to describe, but you can turn two kits into three kits. That's how I've done it. And, but you are required to then only use three shelves, um, but you can put um, 12 printers per rack and each rack is 200 bucks. So your entire cost to have a rack like this stuffed full of Prusas, which again, if you're going to be doing production, Prusas are probably my go-to right now. Again, I'm waiting to see what Bamboo is going to say and what they're going to do and how they're going to handle their uh, supply chain issues, how they're going to handle consumer issues. Because remember, consumers kind of suck. And if you've never dealt with end customers or end consumers before, you don't know how much they actually suck. They really suck. They're going to find ways to break things that you've never found. They're going to find ways to destroy stuff that you've never considered. And they're going to blame you for it every single time. So be ready for that. It's actually why we've kept from having a product on the market is all of the, uh, all of the support is kind of a massive problem, like a massive problem. And will take up like full-time staff members to do it. That's a lot of money. Like I love Prusa because of their support. It's 24 by seven. It's real humans. It's not robots. And it's people that know what the hell they're doing. Now they do generally assume that people are morons as they should, because a lot of people that do buy printers have no damn clue what they're doing and if you do have anybody in your life that has bought a printer and has no idea what the hell they're doing send them over have them watch print fix friday have them watch some of the videos that we talk about because i do think they're valuable and if they do have questions let me know in fact we've been dealing with a commenter who comments a lot thank you for that you know who you are who's been having a real issue with nozzles and they leak like crazy and i'm firmly at 
the decision that they are not properly building their hot ends. Uh, and that they're tightening the nozzle against the block rather than against the heat sink or heat breaks. I might actually even be doing a video of that soon. Anyways. Film Story says the Nebula is a transition filament that wobbles randomly through blue and purple shades. It's lighter than the Galaxy Dark Bloom product. Protopasta came out with three more variations of Nebula too. See, this is why I like having filament stories in the in the chat. Because whenever someone has a filament question, she's like, yeah, uh, Courtney knows what the hell she's doing. She's kind of the filament queen. So talk to her. Um, yeah. <laughs> Just like in IT, everything works perfectly if there were no users. That's correct. And if you're the type of department that decides to ship a change out on 4 p.m. on a Friday, you're working overtime on the weekend and you're probably screwing your boss. <laughs> um, to me, 3D printing is the right decision. Just like how Prusa could easily go over to injection molding. In fact, they have, right? On the Prusa Mini, a lot of the easy parts are fully injection molded. The spool holders are now fully injection molded. Uh, parts that are a pain in the ass, are injection molded, because it's faster. But Prusa, I think, is still 3D printing parts because they don't want to lose the, well, the thousand plus printer print farm. Uh, but um, they don't want to lose the nostalgia of having printed parts. Osrek is, ask, is asking, do you run all of your printers off of 115 amp circuit? No, we do not. Um, but we also don't run all of our printers at the same time. Again, it comes down to having the right machine. So give you an idea. The TAS-6 almost never runs. Uh, the Fusion 3 only runs for big parts because it doesn't have the uh, the detail that I wish it had for a $5,000 printer. It's great for making big-ass parts that can go fast, but it's not really great for doing small detail stuff. Um, the shelves over there are supposed to be populated with more printers, but uh, they were supposed to be cleaned, and I never did. Uh, so a lot of the test printers sit over there. And I agree with Eric Cedarberg that Prusa has printed parts simply as an image at this point. And that's fair. And it works, right? They've got the farm. They've got the ability to do it. So that's what they do. Um, but yeah, all, we have printers on separate circuits. Um, the printers are split between this room and where the standing set is. The standing set's my garage, uh, for those that didn't know that. Um, and if you didn't know that, that means you don't hang out on the live streams where I do stuff. Because I sweat like a disaster. Uh, but there are printers out there that have separate circuits, and we have a dedicated 50 amp 220 uh, sub panel out there that I can break out into multiple. I can do 100 amps of 110 out there. Uh, so if we did want to add more dedicated circuits, it's not that difficult. Um, get an electrician to do it, though, please. Don't 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 try to do that work yourself. Uh, so yeah, it makes sense for me because. Similar to how it's a image for Prusa, it's kind of also an image for us, right? We're using the machines that you guys see all the time to make parts. And the goal for the CR30 is actually to hang it on the back of the standing set. So as I'm filming videos out there, uh, it's, it, it, you, you'll see it drop parts. But the big thing with print farms is battery backups. Now, I'm not going to get into how I built mine because mine are custom built and uh, battery experts out there uh, will cringe because it's really not built great, but the batteries haven't died yet. So I'm not going to replace them. When I do replace them, I'm going to replace them with better batteries. But right now, kind of jank. But the the wall behind me here is one is one bank. It's one 15 amp outlet, but it is on an APC 3000. An APC 3000 can actually provide more watts than the wall can. So should we, for some reason, pop a breaker, I can wait for the printers to heat up and start printing and then go and flip the breaker back on where it won't be pulling 15 amps because the battery backup can push more amperage than the wall. And that's something to take in mind. Like that's, I deliberately did that when we built that, that rack of printers, because if we are running every printer and they're all heating up at the same time, they can. Yes, stuff. I get flack from Bob. That is correct. I get flack from Bob about my, my about my batteries. Um, so unless you really kind of have a good idea of what you're doing, buy off the shelf systems for battery backups. And your goal is to get you through the little power blips. It is not to get you through running 
you know, 20, 30, 40 hours without power, it should be enough to deal with five to 10 minutes of downtime of power. And if you need anything longer than that, have a generator. And whether that's a whole home generator or a whole business generator that automatically kicks on, or it's when you have to go outside and, uh, you know, do a poll starter. If you're real fancy, just, you know, click the button, then it is. But living here in Florida means I have to have pretty substantial battery packs or we will lose prints. So, um, most breakers in the U S are 15 amp. And if it's got the little winky eye, it's a 20 amp. So there you go. There's your, there's your fun fact for American, uh, um, plugs, unless they've put the wrong plug in the wrong area. And then it's just a complete and utter crap shoot. Um, anyways, when we look at the value though, to me, it makes more sense to just simply 3d print it until you know you will likely lose money if you're going to outsource it to somebody like 3d musketeers and i highly recommend you do so i'd like to run these printers a little bit more it has been like untimely slow here and it's no one's fault it's just the climate it's just what's going on but it's been untimely slow like when the printers aren't running behind me it's because we're not busy uh and so i'm working on other things like the making awesome academy which you guys are going to be hearing about hopefully pretty soon where I'm going to use a green screen. That's still weird. It's weird for me to think about that. Anyways, when we deal with production, 3D printing is not designed for full-on production ever. It is not. Now, you can look at companies like Carbon, Nex3D, and some of the others that are doing really, really fast resin printing. That is, um, it's cool. But carbon printers, you can't buy them. You have to rent them. And yes, you can print stupid fast on a carbon M2 or L2. I don't know what the hell their naming scheme is anymore. Um, but you're going to pay a lot for it because it's it's a complete walled garden. It is Haas or Haas, if you will. Hardware as a service versus SaaS, which is software as a service. And it might make more sense for you to, to instead of dealing with hardware as a service, outsource it to a company that already does. Design is the other thing that you have to worry about. We talked about it a little bit earlier, the DFM versus DFAM, and draft angles are probably the toughest thing for those that have been designing for 3D printing that then have to go to design for injection molding to deal with. Draft angles suck. Think of a red solo cup. Everybody knows the red solo cup. You know how it's got the angle on it? That's so it's easy to produce. When you look at an injection mold, let's find a product that has a very obvious draft angle. Everything on my desk are 3D printed. Damn it. Fine. If you have a straight cylinder and you are injection molding like a Pringles can, okay, but a Pringles can that's not a spiral round, a spiral wound cardboard tube, but a plastic tube where it's completely smooth. When you go to eject it, and there's something called an ejector pin that will push the part out of the mold. Now, let's see if I can find ejector pin marks on this. I cannot find ejector pin marks, but I can find the sprue. If you look dead center on this battery, and let's see if I can get it in the light, there's a little dot on the dead center of the battery. That is the sprue mark. That is the mark of where the, the actual plastic is being shot in. Ejector pins will look like little circles because um, that's where you have a set of prongs that are pushing to push the part out of the mold. If you do that and you're running with a straight cylinder, you're going to create a vacuum. And that vacuum often cannot be overcome by the ejector pins themselves. And they'll just shatter a hole through your part instead. Or you're going to shut down the machine because your mold sucks. Instead, you have to add a draft angle. And what that draft angle will do is as soon as you pull the cup back a little bit, air can now get all the way around it and the part just falls right off. Um, Duff says, honestly, for that type of use, I would prefer a rent or lease, assuming service is part of that contract. No. It's not. And yes, the little circle with a nipple. That is correct. He's right. Um, but yeah. You have to deal with all of that. And it is way, way more difficult. 
And the big thing that Awestrike points out as well is that it also makes it stackable. Again, you pay by the container. And if you can pack more stuff into a cubic meter than you could if you did not make the design change, make the design change. Because if you can stack stuff and make it easier to ship and transport, the big one when you're looking at stacking is storage. Because when you get in a shipment of 200,000 pieces, where the hell are you going to put them? Where the absolute hell are you going to put them? Because I don't know. You have to figure that out yourself. And if you have a warehouse, you're going to stack a bunch of stuff in there. And if your parts don't easily stack, you're going to have a disaster of inventory management control. And as my brother Tarzan013 is pointing out, Linus is having a particular problem. I will say, I was more impressed with that LTT backpack than I expected. And the video that he made about it was nothing but a thinly veiled uh, ad. That's all it was. And I watched that entire video and said, shit, that really is a good value. It's $300 backpack that I am not going to buy. But it's a very good value if you are in the market for a premium backpack. I dig it. But yes, the screwdrivers and the backpacks don't stack. And that means that you have to put them probably in what are called Gaylords. And there's a very bad off brand joke there that I'm not going to make, but you can figure it out yourself. Um, and those are basically boxes that fit on pallets. And you do that so that you can put a bunch of stuff into the box and then you move the pallet with a forklift. Gaylords would normally be on the floor or on the second shelf where they're easily accessible. And then you just have to have someone dive in there and grab them. Uh, <laughs> I tune out for a minute and pow, he says the word. Okay, it's technically what they're called, though. All right, don't get don't get on me for this. It's what they're called. Uh, but they're big damn boxes that go onto pallets. They're called Gaylords. I, I, I just... Don't at me for it. At the industry that made the, the names, not me. Uh, but yeah. That would be the way that you do it, but you have all of this airspace, right? It's like when people say when you're trying to stack things like eggs for, for a second. L let's think about chicken eggs. Chicken eggs suck. They're, uh, they're optimized for their purpose, right? They're, they're optimized for giving birth to chicks because, you know, or hatching chicks because they have to, you have to get them out of the chicken. And if they were cubes <laughs> that'd be a really weird looking chicken but i'll tell you if they were cubes the packaging that that eggs would come in would be a lot smaller and you'd pack them in a lot tighter so a dozen eggs might come in a package like this rather than a package like that so you have to look at how that does too and even further if you're going to market you got to look at how it is on a shelf and how much shelf space it takes up because if your product is big and it takes up a shitload of shelf space no one's going to carry it because their opportunity cost of putting five other products in your place is much higher than just putting yours there itself. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to try pooping out a cube. It, it's, a, it's a reference, okay? It, it, it's, it's... Work with me here, okay? Spherical chicken for just a moment. <laughs> Optimize for strength, not for volumetric efficiency. That is correct. Chicken eggs are incredibly strong. Uh, imagine the chickens laying square eggs, though. It's true. What would a chicken look like if it laid square eggs? We are so far off topic right now. But it's on brand for this. And if you don't design it for, for the stacking properties, it's going to be so bad. <laughs> Comments about the chickens are terrible. I feel bad for the chickens. Minecraft chickens. That's right. It would look like a Minecraft chicken. That's exactly what it would look like. Which came first, the square chicken or the square egg? Uh, not that answer. That's not an answer I want. Thank you, Tarzman. Uh, do Minecraft chickens lay square eggs? No, they don't. <laughs> but now I, now I want to make a metal mold that will fry an egg into a cube. I might, I might go do that when we're done here. Because that's like a dumb project I can get behind. Oh my god, we're getting so far off topic. This is on brand. Anyways, gosh. All right. So if you don't optimize your product for stacking, 
and you don't optimize it for shelf efficiency, when you do injection molding, you're going to now get stuck with inventory control issues. And that's why we're choosing to do 3D printing. That is the biggest, biggest win for me for 3D printing. It is just in time manufacturing. Now, if you don't know what just in time is, it's not the uh, watch repair company that sprung out of Justin TV. No, no. It is uh, getting product exactly when you need it. Toyota, previ you know, prior to these past couple of years, has been famous for it. Toyota holds minimal inventory of all of their products, and they have such a good inventory control system that they know when they need to produce more product and where it needs to go based on incredibly complex algorithms for when product should sell. And that means that they hold incredibly low volume of parts in stock, but that also meant when everything went haywire, Toyota was one of the manufacturers that was hit the hardest because they don't keep inventory. With 3D printers, I'm going to probably keep five or six politicians on hand in stock. And then as I get down to two, start another print and make more of them. There is no point in keeping 600 of them or a thousand of them in stock if I don't know if they're going to sell. I think they will. I think the price point, hopefully around 50 bucks, is going to be aggressive enough that people will look at it and say, shit, it should work. Let me go for it. But if it's not, I don't want to maintain all of that inventory, right? And the companies that I'm working with to make the prototypes for the metal parts that I need, um, they know as well. They know my goal right now is like maybe an initial run of 50. And that's it. <laughs> Apparently, according to John Drayton, the Great Wall of China was built with two extra bricks. They ended up with only two extra bricks. That's pretty nuts. Everybody here with the damn write-offs. I know it's a write-off. I know. I know. But it doesn't help if you don't have the profit to write it off to. I know it's a joke and I know it's a meme, just like resin is toxic around here. But you really do got to make sure that you're making the profit to write it off to. Because if you don't, then it's useless to you. Gosh. Anyways. Uh, let's see. Anything else? Okay. And Tarzan013 said, that's why they invented Scrum. And Scrum is one of those cases where it's multiple things at once working together. Uh, where waterfall is start to finish one thing at a time. ADHD brains are scrum brains. Normal people's brains are waterfall brains. That's just normally how that works. And uh, by the way, if you are dealing with ADHD as a maker, and if you haven't been tested, go get tested and uh, look at trying to at least deal with it. You know, look at working with a professional who can help you go through that because there's nothing worse than suffering and not getting that assistance. And no, you're not crazy for going to get the assistance. You're strong. I believe in you. You can do it. There's your soapbox for the day. Isn't this whole podcast a soapbox? I don't know. That one's tough. Scrum was designed by managers looking to appear as if they're busy. I don't, I, 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 uh, I'm going to put citation needed on that, but I wouldn't, it's not unbelievable. <laughs> it's not unbelievable. Um, but Scrum also requires that all parties involved are doing it too. To me, the just-in-time manufacturing capabilities of 3D printing make it more valuable upfront than injection molding. And yes, at some point we might look to take the politician to a full injection molded product. Right, That would reduce my overall cost. I would likely not reduce the overall cost of the consumer. And I'd make more money. But I got to sell a lot of them 3D printed to make the value that then would be injection molded. But I've also only ever designed it to be 3D printed. And that means that I haven't done DFM. And again, the DFM process would be having radii, radii, radiuses, radii, radii at all the corners so that instead of having to use an end mill that can come right at the corner, you can just grab a ball end mill and you're done, right? And the ball end mill is normally the thing that you do last to clean up your molds. It also makes, uh, it also makes for less stress risers. So if you have sharp edges on injection molds, you get stress risers within your components and those stress risers will denote, um, you know, issues of failure 
in your product. Mad Cat USA is asking, what the hell is Scrum? Scrum is a managerial style that involves multiple people working on multiple things at once um, versus one thing start to finish. It is supposedly with the right people um, faster. It's project management. Uh, and it looks like Lavender Devilry got it. And it looks like Tarzan 13 is able to post a link for us. So sweet beans. Um, but yeah, Scrum is a thing. To me, and I think for a lot of you out there that are looking to go to market with a product, you already have a 3D printer. Why spend the extra money? If you do need to get something made out of metal, that's where it might make sense to get some milling made. Or if it's cheap enough, metal, 3D printing. Um, I laughed because uh, on the Prusa XL video that we did, someone commented saying, why would Prusa metal 3D print the gears? I was talking about a powdered metal process and the individual thought I was talking about uh, DMLS or you know metal laser sintering. I wasn't. There's a process called metal injection molding where it's metal powder and it's compressed, similar to a pill, how a pill is compressed powder. Uh, you can do that with metal and then you sinter it out and you can uh, infiltrate it with like a bronze of some sort that makes it a little more, it has higher lubricity than uh, something else would have. You can look at doing that too. For my case, it won't work. And unfortunately, the part that I want to make is three setups on a three axis mill. So I'm hoping I can find somebody with a fourth axis that can do it reasonably cheap. But um, yeah, anyways. Just in time for me makes sense when you're learning, because ultimately that learning process means that you're going to be iterating quickly. Now you should do betas, get betas out to people. I am so far behind on getting betas to people. I said I was going to do that last month and I didn't. I said I was going to do it this month and this month has completely imploded on me and I don't know if that's going to happen, um, but I do want to get betas out to people. So if you do want to uh, have the opportunity to be a beta tester for the politician, um, if you are on the $25 tier or higher on our Patreon, it is a guarantee. You will be offered at no additional cost to you to do it. Um, but if you believe you are qualified and you don't want to support us on Patreon, just email me and we can have a talk. Uh, my preference is that I can somehow have a little bit of cash coming in from like a Patreon tier to do the uh, to do the politician, right? So I'm not just dumping a bunch of money. But ultimately... I've gotten my cost to a point where it's not going to be that bad. It's going to suck, but it won't be that bad. Anyways. If you don't do your product testing, you're going to iterate. But iterating is fine, and you want to do it. You want to see how people are using your product. Are they saying, oh, I don't like the way this is, right? Maybe your beta testers missed it. Maybe your beta testers completely and utterly missed it. Osterich says, please describe what the politician does. It filters and produces hot air like a politician. And if that's not the best damn name for a product on the planet, I don't know what is. Uh, Duff asks if I prefer a Patreon or YouTube channel member. I prefer Patreon personally um, because Patreon will directly integrate with Discord and that is where you can actually see the progress of the politician. Um, it has its own channel now and I need to be updating it more often, but I am in talks to make a very custom part for it where I was doing a lot of manual labor for it. Um, Alexandre is here. Hey, Alexandre, how you doing? Former podcast guest. Go check out the episode with Lychee Slicer if you guys want to see more about Alexandre and the work that he does at Lychee Slicer. But yes, the, the goal here is to go through these processes with as minimal as possible damage to you. And when I say damage, I don't mean like broken bones or things like that. I mean money, time, and most importantly, stress. If you can reduce your stress by automating a process, even though it costs you a little bit more money, do it. Do it, do it, do it. That's what I'm doing. I didn't think we were going to make this step until much later on in the production of the politician. I thought I was going to be doing manual labor processes, but when I saw that it took me over 10 minutes to do one of these by hand, and I'm still sending kits. The politician will not be fully assembled. It's a kit. 
And if it takes me over 10 minutes to do something, good Lord have mercy. It's never going to work. It's never going to work. Right. And if I pay someone $15 an hour to do it, that's like three bucks of their time. I'm not doing that. Is that good math? No, it's terrible math. I don't know. I've been talking for an hour and a half. Someone cut me some slack here. But yes, everyone loves lychee. Lychee, lychee. Never really did come to an agreement on that. <laughs> it is a complicated subject, though, because eventually you do have to make the switch. You have to, right? Prusa sees it. They looked at what the hell takes so long. Those front plates on the minis must have taken hours to 3D print, way more than it made sense. And it made sense to just go ahead and injection mold it. Um, Ostrich says the extra money to automate a process is a tax write-off. It might be, but I'm actually outsourcing part of the develop. I'm, I'm outsourcing the production part of the heat sink and heater assembly um, versus manually doing it here in-house. So it makes more sense for me to do it from there. Maybe. We'll see. Ah, the agreement was lychee slicer, not just lychee. Excuse me. I even violated my own agreement. So yeah, does anyone have any particular questions about this? We, 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 I think we've kind of talked about all of it, right? Return on investment, supply chain, longevity, cost, shipping, importing, strength, material options. Oh, I didn't talk about material options. You can do that real quick. Startup cost talked about DFM versus DFAM. Yeah. All right. Material options. And while I'm in material options, if there are any other things you guys want to know, please, please, please uh, make sure that you put them in the comments. Ray Piercey Slicer says, what a magnificent beard. It's not great. I, I think the camera's honestly helping me out here because uh, it, it, it's it's kind of patchy and I don't know. It makes me not look like I'm 15, okay? So there's that. Some material options. Obviously, we know with 3D printing, we got a lot of material options. And uh, I think it was, was it Nero? Was it Nero that did, um, who did it? Was it Nero that just tried to print Ultima on a Voron? Someone tell me if it was. Um, if so, if it was, fine. Don't try to print Ultima non-Ultem printers. I'm going to make that a Print Fix Friday thing. Because I actually have some real Ultem here and I can show you guys what it's like. Because it's pretty dope. How fast can you 3D print a steel mold? Very fast. But I have access to titanium 3D printers. So, not everyone does. Um... But you are limited more in 3D printing. And a lot of that limit is because of how 3D printers produce items. Resin printers, to me, are where you move if you can. Part of me wants to move the politician to resin printing because it would be way faster. Way faster. <laughs> Philemon Story says, wait, I bought some Ultim after Nero's excellent video. I'm printing it on my toy box. I want to be very clear. I know that that is sarcasm. And no one just buys Ultim. It's $600 a kilogram. You don't just buy Ultem. I have a 50 gram sample roll that came to me years and years and years ago. And uh, it's crazy stuff. Yeah, I'll, I'll do a video on it and I'll show you guys. You can literally hit it with a blowtorch and it does not catch fire. It carbonizes. It's one of the only materials that is certified for flight by the FAA and requires a, a certificate of compliance throughout the whole process. It's a disaster of a material to print. But if you can print it, you can sell it for shitloads of money. But you could easily injection mold Ultem. Like, way easier than you think. Because Ultem is, while it is a little sticky, it's pretty easy to heat up. You need to heat it really hot, like 450C. But so what? It's just more heating. And when your machine's made of steel, it's no big deal. It doesn't matter. So it is common to see a lot of Ultem be injection molded these days. Or, you buy bricks of Ultem and you mill it. Because it mills wonderfully so does peak and peck that was also mill um you know incredibly well john drayton says uh someone can 3d print an entire airplane now i don't I, we're talking like internal pieces stuff like that because they don't they're uh ul94 v0 which is fire retardant they are fire retardant by nature um and you are not allowed to put things on airplanes that are flammable right uh not during manufacturing because that's kind of a known problem anyways 
Oh, apparently they're also called West Packs or Tri Walls or just Cardboards. Huh. Cool. I've always called them Gaylords. <laughs> I can tell how far people are back in the podcast because, yeah, they're like 20 minutes behind. Um, it's true. If anyone was going to buy Old Tim, it was going to be Filament Stories. Um, anyways. You are limited a lot more on 3D printing. What you can pr what you can print with, like traditionally speaking, injection molding it's ABS. Now I don't like ABS. I've never liked ABS. I don't like it as a plastic. I don't like it as a printing material. I just don't like it. Period. I don't like it. Period. And the reason I don't like it is because it is liquefied dinosaurs. It is a non. Uh, it, 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 it's non renewable. You will run out of ABS at some point. I much for something like a polyethylene, something that's a synthetic plastic that can also be recycled. A lot of people choose polypropylene because polypropylene is, generally speaking, reasonably optically clear and it is recyclable. I think it's number five for recyclability um, or PET, which is similar to PETG. My intention is to make the politician out of PETG. And then when it goes to injection molding, look at HDPE, LDPE, as well as PET. So that's high density polyethylene, low density polyethylene, or PET, which is uh poly some I don't know. It, it it's a copolyester. They're copolyesters. Um yeah. Anyways. With injection molding, your only concerns are what type of stresses that it puts on the mold itself. If you're dealing with an injection mold that has lots of small features, something like a polycarbonate is going to be a disaster. You would want to use like a polypropylene, something that doesn't shrink as much. You want to be able to control shrinkage. And the gentlemen out there know a lot about controlling shrinkage because anyways, uh, and if you can do that and you can get it properly in your mold, then you'll be all right. But if you're not designing specifically for materials that shrink a lot, you're going to have a part that welds itself into your mold. And really, the only way to get it out is a blowtorch or pry bars. Pry bars can mess up your molds. So when I look at it, I say, okay, it makes more sense for me to 3D print at the moment because it is more efficient. Robert Mason is asking if this is a weekly scheduled stream. Weekly-ish. They are done weekly. Um, sometimes we have a guest, sometimes they are, uh, just solo episodes. Um, this one was supposed to be on metal 3d printing, but, uh, the guest at the last minute canceled. So I said, F it, it's going to be a business episode. So if I'm ever doing a solo cast, it's because we didn't have a guest. So that happens. Um, normally I try to do them Saturdays at 2 PM, but because I only found out about the cancellation late Friday night, I decided to do this on Sunday instead. Um, but yes, they are weekly. I've been doing it now for 101 weeks straight every single week. And I've never missed a week, um, cause it is fun to talk to you guys. It's fun to have these live streams every now and then we also do live streams where we're just working on stuff. And I am routinely live in our discord. If you do want to support us, of course, uh, all of that is in the description and the $10 tier and higher gets you access to our company discord where you're able to hang out with myself and the other musketeers. Um, do injection molds or 3d printing produce less waste slash support material? That is, it varies. Um, so with injection molds, you have runners or sprues. It, technically they're kind of the same thing, but they're also kind of not. And the people that are into injection molding will murder me for saying that. But from a user standpoint, a sprue and a runner are effectively the same thing. Just go with me. But on the injection molding process, if you do have sprues and runners, there are normally machines to take care of that for you. And there might be a mold that is made to cut off the sprue or a cutting device that is made to cut off the runners, right? If you remember the like Gundam models, how they have, you know, the frame, that's a runner. And then from the runner to your part, which gets really thin, that I believe is the sprue. Could be wrong. Uh, but as Duff says, if you do want to receive uh, notice of the live stream, Use the notifications on YouTube and follow us on all the social medias because I do post it at least a few hours in advance and turn on notifications there too. 
Twitter is probably one of the easier ones, but Twitter is like where I'm on social media a lot. And so a lot of things on there, there's more shit posting on Twitter than there is anywhere else, right? Everywhere else is very professional because I don't do those. Uh, but Twitter is the one that I, that I'm on a lot because that's where a lot of the 3d printing community is. Um, if you design your 3D printed parts appropriately, you should have little to no support material. So your waste, other than failed parts, should be basically zero. You'll have a skirt line, maybe a purge line or something like that, but effectively your waste should be zero. Um, now, if you're going to be realistic about it, your waste is probably going to be closer to 10% uh, between failures and skirts and that kind of stuff. Uh, maybe a little bit of support material. Injection molding, it can depend. The big thing with injection molding, though, is that there is a defined recycling product, uh, procedure for all of it, right? Uh, there are companies that work with injection molders that buy the scrap, whether it's failed parts, uh, the runners, the sprues, and all that, and then they regrind it, they re-extrude it, and they move on. A lot of people like polystyrene, and I don't like styrene plastics, period, because same deal, liquefied dinosaurs. But polystyrene is very, very interesting as a plastic because it is infinitely recyclable without adding virgin material. ABS kind of is, but kind of isn't. You got to be careful on that one. Um, but that's why they're used so often because it's infinitely recyclable. The problem with polystyrene is that it is not like safely recycled. It puts off nasty fumes. It is not good for the environment. And there's no way for it to biodegrade. It does not, de it can't be decomposed. Now, there are super worms that are effectively bred to be able to process polystyrene and they eat it and they turn it into something else. I forget what the hell it is, but they could eat the microplastics, turn it into other stuff. But yeah. And uh, as Shotgunner5609 says, he's got some real bangers in the podcast playlist just looking through there, too. And I will say the ones I am very proud of. I'm very proud of the one with Seth Polanski. I am very proud of the one with Lisa Lloyd. I am very proud of the one with Chun Ung. I am very proud of the one with um, Kenneth Johnson. And I'm very proud of the one with, uh, frankly, Built, because that was number 100 and that was a big deal for me. But... Of course, I'm also proud of the one with Philemon Stories, where we talked as well. Uh, I'm honestly, I'm, I'm really proud of a lot of them. Some of them go better than others, but a lot of that is outside of my control, whether that's internet or anything like that. I do recommend skipping like the first, I don't know, few, because that was like when we were trying to figure our shit out. Um, now we kind of have a, a stride where we get back moving in the right direction. But yeah, we plastics are a complicated thing. Cause like, can you print polycarbonate on a 3d printer? Well, yeah, you can, but from a production standpoint, you don't generally, if I'm going to print polycarbonate, I'm going to ask if I can add carbon fiber to it because the carbon fiber keeps polycarbonate, keeps nylon, even keeps ABS from warping as bad as it normally would. That is a big deal when you're talking about production. Because if you're having problems with your parts warping, then you've got a problem with your end product. Now, a buddy of mine, um, I know his name, and I forget his company name, and I don't want to just out him by his real name, so a buddy of mine from Slovakia runs print farms, and he prints basically purely in ABS. And he runs Prusas, open air. And a lot of you are like, how the hell does he do it? How the hell does he do it? He designs his parts to be printed in ABS. The thing with ABS is that it shrinks, right? When it cools, it shrinks. And instead of having a big flat plate, he has thin lines that touch the build plate. So there's not as much, um, uh, what's the right term? There, there's not as much force on it because there's not as much force touching the build plate. Uh, thank you. Red Slash Ace for the uh, Earth Fund. If you guys don't know who Red Slash Ace is, his name is Peter. Uh, he does scent VR. So if you want to go check him out, um, he's actually been featured on Linus Tech Tips, which is kind of cool. You know, uh, it, the pretty cool thing there. But he he adds an extra level to VR, which is pretty damn cool. I don't do VR. It's just not my thing. But if you do VR, it should be your thing. Anyways, um, 
But yeah, thank you guys for contributing to the Earth Fund. I I, I do greatly appreciate it. It is literally smell vision That is correct. Um, Tarzman, can you post the link to the LTT video so um, people can go watch it? That'd be great. Thank you. Um, but yeah, if you design properly, you end up dealing with um, better features, right? His company in Slovakia is ISO 9001. 2015 certified which iso requires that you have a manual of processes and procedures which is so crazy so freaking crazy to do especially when you're 3d printing because there are so many variables involved in the 3d printing process he has figured out how to control them and that is what makes his company special that's a big deal and iso Cert certs are like that's government work if you're getting iso certs it's because you're doing government work um but yeah so some materials are more difficult but if you design for them and you understand why you understand why it does what it does you can do it but you might say grant i can just put a draft shield on this printer no don't do that it's a huge waste of, of time and material what you could do is use a politician because uh they are actually being developed to work for fdm as well and something like a wham bam hot box or a cardboard box for all I care, but just don't do that long term because it's kind of dangerous. If you can control your temperature of your chamber of your printer and it's actively heated and filtered, you can print some really nasty stuff without having too many issues. Now, I'm not going to make any claims on the filtering thing. There is some carbon in the way to help filter out the smell. It's probably not going to do jack shit for particulate, but I'm not making any claims about that. So don't take words out of my mouth or something like that. But I think there are more opportunities for injection molding for materials, but they get very expensive. Similar to how the cost of nylon is like 60 to 80 bucks a kilo, but PLA is like 15 to 20 bucks a kilo. That is similar in injection molding. And some shops might say, hey, I'm running PET all the time. Can we just do your parts out of PET? Because they have to clean out their machine or get another machine to run those other materials. So, yeah. Uh, John Drayton asks, how is the control of the build chamber different than the temperature control for the hot end? This would be a separate system. So if your printer doesn't have, a, if it has an enclosure, right, you use your heat bed as a heater right and it will just slowly heat your chamber but even on the big fusion 3 up here with a heated bed that is 450 watts it cannot get the chamber above 40c it just can't do it i've tried and tried and tried i've never been able to get that chamber above 40c i tossed one of my prototype politicians in there and i had it sitting at 65 within 20 minutes like and that's a big damn enclosure with a lot of metal so it's sinking away the heat from you constantly um, but that's not really what it's designed for. You want, you would put a chamber heater in a printer that doesn't have a chamber and you're building a chamber that is insulated. Um, so maybe you're buying one of the Prusa enclosures and you're adding a politician into that. That would be a great way to control it, but that would be a manual control. I'm not currently going to be doing it so you can control it via software because that would just add too much to the cost of the product. I want, we're trying to keep the cost effectively low on it. So I hope that answers your question. And yes, Filament Stories is fire. Go follow them. Uh, but yeah, materials can be complicated because it all depends on the shop. But the shop might also charge you a tax, you know, an, an asshole tax or, a, you know, whatever extra fee for running harder materials. And it will burn through your molds faster. So you have to look at what that's going to do. Like a glass fiber is going to basically cut the mold hours or the mold shots in half. And you also might have to pay extra for it, not only because the material is more expensive, but because that you deal with ruining other parts on the injection molding machine. So they need to amortize out their cost. So I think we're kind of at a good place to wrap. If you guys have any other things you want, get them in the comments now so I can look at it. But let's kind of run a TLDR on it, right? which you're going to hear at the end, so whatever. 
return on investment. Upfront 3D printing is better because it has a much lower startup cost. But in the long run, it is absolutely the worst way to do it because it is expensive and slow. Supply chain means that if you choose to go overseas for your injection molding, you might end up stuck in the Suez Canal or you might end up with a global you-know-what that is going to cause everything to have an issue. Longevity speaking, 3D printers are pretty good if you oil them every now and then, but as a business, you're going to replace them when they break and not maintain them as much. And a injection mold is going to last at least 50 to 80,000 components, if not more. Cost, of course, 3D printing is more expensive per part, but if you're only making a few and you want to test out the waters, it's much better for that. Whereas injection molding, of course, is considerably more affordable, but you deal with that high upfront cost. So you amortize it out. Amortization is you take, let's say it's 100,000 pieces, your mold is $100,000, each part just costs you an extra $1. That is amortization in a very, very, very small way of describing it. Strength, injection molded parts are going to be stronger, 99 times out of 100. So there, um, you can get good strength out of uh, 3D printed plastics, but you just got to know how to print it. Orientation matters a lot. Material options are about the same for both, but you would need specialized machines for 3D printing to do some of the stuff that non-specialized machines for injection molding can do. It can be more expensive to do it one way than the other. Startup costs we covered a little bit. That is way more expensive to do injection molding, but you can look at doing your in-between, which is roto molding, resin casting, or something along those lines. We have DFM versus DFAM. That's designed for manufacturing, designed for additive manufacturing, and they both have a little bit different. And if you know you're going to go to injection molding, start with DFM from the beginning. Don't start with DFAM because then you got to go back and reiterate. And that is what is called technical debt. And if you want to learn more about that, Pooch has his own podcast called Maker That Money. And his recent episode that came out uh, on the 12th of August talks all about technical debt. So I think I've kind of covered all the things that we came here to cover. So thank you guys for hanging out. Um, we can see that all is saying in my experience, a chamber heater needs to produce at least as much heat as the build plate to get a decent bump in temperature. That is correct. I agree. Um, if it is not as strong as your chamber heater or as your build plate, it will take a very long time. And that's why I said 20 minutes. I can get an Elegoo Mars two pro or Elegoo Saturn up to 30 C in about 45 seconds. So, uh, those don't have chamber heaters. That's the original product that we were building it for. <laughs> Uh, let's see. I'm assuming some shops might just say, might just give you an F off price depending on how busy they are too. Absolutely. They will, um, go get multiple quotes for multiple people. And if you can, if they're local, if you live in a port city specifically, that's where a lot of manufacturing occurs. Uh, go talk with people, go walk in and meet them. A lot of these people are going to be old school. Um, I don't know if this matters, but traditionally I found them to be conservative politically. So if that's a problem for you, don't speak politics when you go. And just kind of take a lay of the land um, and talk to them. Shake hands. A lot more gets done with a handshake than a phone call. But the world has kind of changed from that. So, you know, play that with a grain of salt. Uh, let's see. So printer farms should all be done in temperature controlled chambers. You can temperature control the chamber. Or if you're doing a true farm, you temperature control the room. You let the room get hot. You let your, like, so Prusa's print farm runs like 110 degrees Fahrenheit often. Um, they run very close to like 40 C because there's no point not to. <laughs> the printer's going to heat the room anyways. Why try to stop it? No one really spends a bunch of time in there. Let it get hot. Uh, let's see what else we got. I know we do that in roofing industry when we get swamped. Yeah, the F off price. I wish I knew about amortization when I bought the Ticonderoga. <laughs> and cubic eggs. Yes, we talked about cubic eggs as well. Uh, so what's the write-off on chamber heaters? <laughs> um, I can actually write off the entire development of it, which is kind of cool. Uh, and I can write off any of the uh, research and development that we do surrounding it. So that's pretty cool. Um, so this episode needs to be renamed to cubic, cubed eggs. I did put in the description that... Uh, uh, DFM, DFAM, and many more. So I guess I'll have to put, uh, cubed eggs there. I've now updated the description to include cubed eggs. So it's not gonna make any sense to people that read it. 
I'm not going to add that to the, uh, to the title. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for coming out. Um, this has been episode 101 uh, or season two, episode 49 of the Make You Awesome podcast. Remember, if you like what we do and you want to support us, you can do so at Patreon. You can do so by joining YouTube for a channel membership and uh, you just hang out with us, right? You can also do, um, uh, what is it? Super chats and all that that help us get to Earth. I greatly appreciate it because it is going to be like a grand per person to go to Earth, but we're going to do it. We're going to get there and I'm going to bring my scanners. So if you are someone that hangs out in these and you come and find me at Earth, I'll scan you. It'll be a lot of fun. But you all know what I'm going to say. Stay safe out there. Don't forget to call your loved ones. And as always, keep making awesome. Have a good one.